Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Zihan, um, for the wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you to all our wonderful panelists for joining us today. And most importantly, thank you to our pa participants for joining us um, on Friday morning to talk about a conversation that may not necessarily be easy, but is incredibly important. Um, just before I pass it on to Dr. Chua to get into our presentation, uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes to emphasize why it's important to talk about youth suicides and why it's relevant to ideas and social policy. Um, as Trisha has mentioned, Ideas is a public policy think tank and we advocate for evidence-based policies for our country. Under social policy unit specifically, uh, we look at the sort of interconnectedness between the different aspects of society and how it affects the well-being of people. Um, suicide is a phenomenon that can affect anyone, and it is not only a product of mental illness. Um, broad brushing all suicides as a product of mental illness is in many ways a failure in recognizing the deepest stresses within our society that drive suicides inequality, racism, political instabilities, global pandemics, and the resulting loss of lives and livelihoods that essentially creates an environment within our society that is undesirable. Um, we will today discuss what the economic cost of youth suicide is. And this may be an important factor to consider, and it is a useful tool to sort of understand the scale of the problem, especially in a society where we attach a lot of value to growth in the form of economic gains. But I think it is important and it is crucial to recognize that suicides, especially youth suicides, is more than the loss of productive individuals who can contribute to the economy of a country but it is the loss of individuals, is the result of individuals being in severe distress and symptoms of stresses that go beyond just economic gains. It is a social and public health issue and it needs to be addressed in that manner and policy solutions need to go beyond health sector. Um, with that, I hope that we can have a good, open, honest um, and productive conversation um, and hopefully walk away with some important next steps to prevent suicide collectively. Um, I will end there and pass it on to Dr. Chor to start our presentation of the paper. Thank you, Vaishnavi. I think the slides should appear. Oh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time. It's, it's still quite early. I hope you have a nice cup of coffee um, next to you. Uh, while we strap ourselves in, this is going to be a relatively short talk because I think we're going to focus most of our time on and the interesting discussion with our very esteemed panelists. Uh, I've been asked to, before we jump into it again, say a couple of words about RELATE. So I'm a, I'm a clinical psychologist and clinical psychs are not very well trained in public health. I, RELATE offers um, subsidized psychotherapy services, but you know, the more we went into it, the more I realized we really don't have a lot of research. And if we want the system to change, we need to take a public health approach. So this collaboration with ideas is really meaningful. And I hope um, it would also spark your interest in how we can start to view mental health issues or, you know, what we consider, you know, a subset of you know, the, the group that must not be spoken about, that really this is part of our society. And we have to take a public health approach to this. Okay, so let's jump into it. Now, um, I actually like plan to open my presentation, you know, maybe we're talking about like, we need more awareness, uh, we should all be worried as a collective society, but we're past the point of awareness. You know, we, we need to take action now. You know, we can't keep just talking about saying, sort of blowing our, our you know, standing on the soapbox and saying, you got to pay attention, you got to care about mental health. It's not you just got to care about mental health. It's not just that you have to be, you have to have mental health literacy, it's that we have to start taking action to improve mental health in society, to improve the lives of people in society. Now I'm going to talk about mental health, not just, you know, in terms of, mental health conditions like clinical depression and anxiety, but really mental health as the full continuum because all of us have mental health and in distress, that's when we need, and a, a good number of people right now during the COVID-19 pandemic are in distress. You listening, someone out there, I'm sure listening to this talk is not having a great day, maybe not even a great month, maybe not even a great year. and. Or you may know someone like that. And this 
is about how do we help people in our midst? How do we help our friends? How do we help our family members? How do we help ourselves to have a better life in this society? Now, suicide, we've, we, you've have heard a couple of times already by Tengu Zain and Trisha and Zihan, you know, suicide is one of the leading causes of death among youths, right? Okay, we got that. But, but yet, if it's one of the leading causes of, of death among youth, why is not more being done to reverse this worrying and, and growing trend? Now, I was, I was thinking about this yesterday. I was thinking, how do I impress upon the audience, even the press of my, myself, that we need more done? Now, consider this, okay? Transport accidents is the, actually the number one cause of death among youths. Accidents, yeah, everyone knows how bad it is. And, and everyone seems to be acting to increase road safety. So we have various government ministries, NGOs, private corporations, people from society working together, launching public campaigns on road safety, constructing safer roads, regulations to ensure that vehicles pass a certain safety standards, then making sure that road users are better educated, making sure that road management post accident is effective and efficient. But yet, you know, despite all this work, people would say, yeah, a lot needs to be done. A lot more needs to be done. Now then go to suicide. What's happening? Now, it's, it's one of the leading causes of death. Now, if you look at it, and I think it, uh, Trisha cited um, some official stats put up by police, the Raja Malaysia, the estimated about one suicide a day in, in Malaysia. And that's the same as the National Suicide Registry. Again, you know, one about averaging about one suicide a day. Now, so we have here, you can see that the official stats, that's only one suicide a day. It's shocking, right? But the likelihood is that this is an understatement of that true suicide rate in this country. Because, it, I mean, we all know that it's underreported. It's probably the case that more than one person in Malaysia takes their life every day. So I've cited uh, the emeritus professor of psychiatry at UKM, Professor T. Maniam, who has done a lot of work on suicide in Malaysia. And he actually argues that many suicides are misclassified as undetermined violent deaths, and that a more accurate estimation of suicide rates is actually between 8 to 13 per 100 population. So I took the average 10.5, but that's averaging about eight people a day, eight suicides, or somewhere between 2,400 and 3,900 deaths due to suicide every year. So Professor Maniam's estimate of suicide is 6.5 to 10.5 times higher than the official stats. But maybe you're saying that's too high. And actually, Professor Maniam does argue that, okay, it may be overestimation. So we'll take the more conservative, modern estimation that even the Ministry of Health put forward. And they estimate that it's about 5.8% uh, per 100,000 population of five suicides a day. And that actually matches pretty closely with the World Health Organization's estimation of Malaysia's suicide rate of 6.2 per 100,000 population. So. You can see, I mean, even a moderate estimation of how many people are ending their lives by suicide is five. It's five times higher than official stats. So if we then take that number of we're using the WHO estimates, if you go to the next slide and we take, okay, how many youths are in Malaysia, we can estimate the number of people, the number of young people who ended their lives by suicide. And you can really see here on this graph that it peaks, right? It starts to go up um, at 15 to 19, it goes up even higher, 20 to 24, 25 to 29, it starts a little bit leveling off. If you continue along the uh, lifespan, it'll go back down and then among the elderly. Now, that's another story, um, but so about uh, suicides among the elderly, but today we're gonna focus on suicides among youths. So if you go to the next slide, we can come up with an estimation, 382 young men, 141 young women died by suicide in 2019. 
Trisha has referred to the economic cost of youth suicide, 346.2 million. Some of you may be wondering, how do we calculate that very briefly? Because this is not the talk for that. We just calculate, we estimated how much they would have earned. So projecting forward, if they were alive and they did not end their lives so young. So preventable deaths cost our country in 2019, 300, almost 350 million. And the thing is that the World Health Organization estimates that, uh, you can go next slide, for every death by suicide, there are about 20 suicide attempts. The slide hasn't changed yet, so you can just listen to my voice. Okay, there we go. So it, it's not just, now you think about it, there's about 500 youths. And then you go, whoa, like, but for every, every person, 20 more, 20 more suicide attempts are happening. It really shows you how great this problem is. And not only that, for every suicide, more than 100 people are impacted by that death and a greater risk of ill health. So what does that mean? Because if you know someone who has ended their life by suicide, you are actually at greater risk for depression, for anxiety, for PTSD, you are affected by that person's life. So now we, we, it really shows us that, no, it's not just the 500 youths that we should care about. It's the 500 times 20, and then it's the 500 times 20 times 100 people that we should care about. So really, it's a big part of our population. Now, then you'll be wondering, okay, we got this, you know, Dr. Chua, it's important. We should pay attention to this, but like what increases the chances that someone will take their lives? If you go to the next slide, we'll talk very briefly and fairly quickly. And that's my dog barking. He doesn't like that, sorry. <laughs> we just have to ignore him. Um, very well-known risk factors includes age. There you go, adolescence. So if they're younger, as I wish we showed you, gender, which are males and mental health conditions. So give me one minute. Okay, there we go. Uh, mental health conditions, you know, particularly depression, or especially the severe mental health conditions like schizophrenia. But the interesting thing is, and this is a cross-cultural difference, that actually in Asia, a lot more deaths by suicide happen due to interpersonal crisis. So after, an argument or after interpersonal conflict. And when people's distress gets too overwhelming, suicide is their impulsive act. And it's not because they're weak or anything. It is part of, they don't know how to handle their emotional regulation. It is because the distress is so much and they see no way out of the situation that they feel trapped in and they have they think, man, death is going to be better than the suffering. And so that is definitely, it shows you this is a preventable suicide. Uh, we're losing people to preventable deaths. And I'm now going to hand the time over to Vice Navi to continue on with the risk factors and some of the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks, Sukning. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, all right, great. So as Sukning has mentioned, um, you know, these are factors that um, are, there are multiple different risk factors that can drive suicide. And um, what we're going to discuss today is just a fraction of that. Um, and this, I'm just going to move into the sort of social factors that can drive suicide. And within Malaysia, um, we, we have a multicultural um, society. And uh, based on the statistics available, um, the highest rates of suicide attempts has consistently been reported in Malaysians of Indian ethnicity. Um, and some of the most common causes for suicides within this population are interpersonal issues and poverty. Um, and as uh, Sukning has mentioned earlier, interpersonal issues can uh, sort of trigger um, the, the, the attempt of suicide and poverty in general is associated with unemployment, alcoholism, social crimes and poor physical health, which increases the risk of death by suicide. Um, so I'll just move on to the next uh, risk factor. Um, so unemployment. Um, so we've been seeing such a rise in unemployment over the last year. 
and it is kind it is this decay of of you I mean you lose when you lose your job and you have no prospects for job um for a lot of people a lot of value in life is attached to holding on a job um and and keeping livelihoods essentially and unemployment can actually result in a two to three fold increase in the risk of suicide um long term unemployment um can also further affect your confidence your resilience and this is especially true for young people um they're just entering the job market they're trying to figure out what really works for them where they fit in society and given a sort of global pandemic that comes in um that really kind of decays your your resilience and your confidence as to where you fit into society when you are struggling to find uh jobs um and i think uh unemployment in youth has definitely has increased so much more in the last year and as we have witnessed um it is going to continue to increase um this is a very crucial risk factor that we need to keep in mind when targeting prevention strategies moving forward um next slide please so yeah so as as we've discussed um you know these are just a fraction of of risk factors um that increases the likelihood of suicide behavior i do again want to reiterate that suicide it's a complex phenomenon and it is rarely the outcome of one single factor and it's often an interaction of all these biological age uh gender um psychological mental health issues issues and social factors such as employment uh sexual abuse uh ethnicity that does um alongside stressful events does make an individual more likely to attempt suicide um so yeah so let's now move on to the next slide all right so this is a few recommendations we have uh put forth in this paper um and there are probably a lot so the longer term things that we can work on i think this is kind of the starting point um to to address youth suicides and go beyond sort of awareness raising um i will sort of start off with um ethical media reporting um can we move on to the next slide please all right so in malaysia we see a lot of media coverage on suicides and it is often um unfortunately um reliant on sensational headlines and unethical reporting of real pictures of suicides and these bear in mind these are individuals and families who are already dealing with a very distressing um situation and life event and reporting pictures of real suicides is in many ways just it's simply just unethical and it is a risk factor uh, for copycat suicides Um in Malaysia we actually have a guideline for media reporting on suicides that was developed by Ministry of Health in 2013 however the actual implementation and whether or not it's actually adhered to by Malaysian suicide uh, Malaysian media outlets um is un- I mean it's it's not basically and it's something that we all sort of need to work together and I mean having this guideline is is useful and it's great that the ministry of health has sort of put on that initiative to put forth a guideline but there needs to be more practical um ways in which we can increase the buy in and implementation of the guidelines and to do so we sort of need journalism and media education and when the guideline is put forth um implementing it requires training of journalists training of media outlets and training that is facilitated by mental health professionals and the government in order for these guidelines to actually be implemented um and moving forward we do need this time time like time after the time we need to we need to have evaluations of media to make sure that these uh guidelines are actually being adhered to so yeah uh, can we move on to the next slide please so yeah i mean we've we've talked about we've talked a lot about how suicide is not just a mental health issue it is something that goes beyond just mental illness so to actually address this uh holistically we cannot solely rely on the ministry of health um to prevent suicides and sort of have them bear the sole responsibility um of uh addressing this issue um there is sort of when we talk about youth in malaysia and you talk about youth generally we we have this umbrella 
uh, term of the youth population. But sort of within that population, we have various different age groups. You have young kids who are still in school and in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. And then you also have youth who are just entering the job market and just sort of within that workplace setting. So when it comes to prevention, it really needs to target various different stakeholders and various different platforms uh, to address, uh, to implement suicide prevention strategies. Um, so it, within young people who are in formal education, you really need that engagement from Ministry of Education to implement uh, a platform and strategies within the educational setting. Um, and then when you have kids who started, uh, young people who are in workplaces, we need the sort of collaboration from Ministry of Human Resources Resources to implement guidelines within workplaces. And we also obviously need on a community level engagement from Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development. So beyond, beyond just government, um, I think there, is, there has been a lot of NGOs who are on the ground, just like Relate, uh, we have Miasa, we have Minda Kami, we have all these NGOs who have worked tirelessly on the ground trying to spread awareness and pass on resources to individuals who are struggling. So they really do have a very clear insight as to what is going on on the ground. Mindekami specifically has a very youth-centric approach. A lot of youth do sort of look up to this, this uh, platform to express their concerns and, and, and seek resources. So engaging these organizations within um, Malaysia is really key to having effective dissemination of prevention strategies. Um, and of course, most importantly, we need to make sure that all these uh, prevention and this engagement and collaboration is facilitated by mental health professionals so that it stays evidence-based. Um, so yeah, can we move on to the next uh, recommendation? So we, we've talked a lot about data and our lack of understanding of the true scale of suicides. Um, and we used to have a registry for uh, suicides in Malaysia, but unfortunately it was discontinued if I'm not mistaken, in 2008 or 2009. Um, however, the government has mentioned that they will be uh, re reinstating uh, the National Suicide Registry. However, it's cur currently been proposed as National Suicide and Fatal, Fatal in Registry Malaysia. Um, and this is uh, supposed to be uh, active this year onwards. Um, so we're really looking forward to that being implemented and to be able to get a better understanding of the scale of the problem. Um, we do recommend that if this registry is reinstated, the data on uh, age, gender, ethnicity, state is all, it's a comprehensive registry that collects uh, information that will allow us to have a better understanding of where to target interventions. Um, with that, I will pass it on to Dr. Chua to finish off our recommendation and end our presentation. Thank you. Okay, so finally, suicide uh, prevention campaigns. And this is actually quite close to my heart. When uh, Relate first started, very uh, 2016, Trisha dated me. Um, well, like, one of the things that I was wondering was how are we going to have public health campaigns? And I noticed that we have many sort of flash campaigns, you know, they start maybe in January, finishes by Feb, and then you, you don't really see a sustained change. So we need to think about efficacy, you know, we need um, campaigns to raise awareness, increase help seeking and decrease stigma. And I wanna mention decrease stigma because sometimes public health campaigns can backfire you know, so if we're not careful in, in terms of checking and, and assessing, is this message going to land well with the target audience? You know, will they understand it? Um, will will the attitudes change in the manner we want them to? Then don't do it. You know, so we can't just think, hey, you know what? I've got a great idea for a campaign. Let's just do it. We got to do a lot more groundwork before and after to make sure we're putting the money into effective campaigns. We also have to account for demographic differences between groups. Targeting someone who is 15 years old is quite different from targeting someone, uh, you know, the 20, 25 to 29 year olds. And the message might land differently as well. And finally, one thing is to provide realistic, helpful solutions. So asking someone to say, hey, you know what, just talk. And if you're like, People who are in distress and, 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 you know, at that point of thinking of ending their lives, they go, well, who am I going to talk to? So we can't just give sort of this pithy 
thing and go like, you know what, you should just talk. And then because then it ends up, we're kind of blaming them. Because it's like, well, this is why you're so distressed because you didn't talk. But actually it's on us. Do, are we providing the people, the right people, the people who know how to listen well for them to seek help? You can go to next slide and I'll, I'll skip this one. Okay, so I really, uh, you can download the full report by the way from uh, the Ideas and Relate Malaysia website. I wanna really thank you uh, for being here. As I'm talking, I feel like I'm like talking way too passionately already um, because this is, this is really important. I didn't expect to be teary. <clears throat> Um, but this is an issue if you think about so many people are dying every day and we need to do something now. So I'm so glad that like the response has been tremendous and that so many people are interested. And I really ask that we are all committed sincerely to work together to take urgent action that's required to make sure that people in pain and in distress are going to get the help that they need and not only them, but your family and friends, that they get the support that they need. We really need to ensure every Malaysian has the support that they need to understand and overcome their pain. Because chances are, guys, you know, one day it's going to be us, someone we love that needs that. So thank you today and, and let's make a commitment, work together to do better and raise the standard of public mental health policy and services in Malaysia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chua and Base Navi for that very insightful presentation. And Dr. Chua, that was very moving. And you know, I think we all share your passion and we all will do whatever that we can to, to improve the situation. And just to echo what Base Navi said, you know, factors around suicide goes beyond just mental illness, right? It's about employment, education, the media, community development. So this tells us that all of us can play a role and to take a responsibility in taking action, right? To prevent this from, from, from worsening. Okay, so that brings us to our panel discussion. So I'd like to invite Ms. Trisha Rio to come back to moderate the discussion for today. Thank you so much, uh, Zihan. And thank you to Dr. Chua Sotning and Vice Navi for their wonderful presentations. Um, you can tell by the words that they've used that they are really passionate about the subject and I think it does bring this topic to a different light when any of us has known someone. Um, and I think when Dr. Chua was asking the question whether all of us who are in attendance today have known someone who have taken their lives by suicide and uh, I definitely do as well. In fact, it was a family relative and I was at a very young age when this happened. Um, but thankfully, I had uh, good people around me who were able to talk to me and to the rest of my family members to uh, help us to process the whole thing, to understand what had actually happened. But without further ado, uh, you're all here to listen to our esteemed panelists. So what I'm going to do is I will now uh, introduce each of them one by one and I invite them as I'm introducing them and their backgrounds to just turn on their videos, come in. And then I will be going straight into asking them questions. So it's going to be a lot more interactive uh, rather than a typical panel where they're presenting something because we've already had presentations. So now is the time to reflect on this and to see what we can do in terms of action moving forward. So I would like to introduce uh, Yang Amat Mulia Tengku Putri, Raja Tengku Putri Iman, Afzan Al Sultan Abdullah. Um, we will refer to her as Tengku Iman. So hello, good morning, Tengku Iman. Okay. Tengku Iman is the co-founder and president of the Green Ribbon Group, a social enterprise that aims to push mental health agenda forward in Malaysia. By advocating, fundraising, and collaborating, the Green Ribbon Group hopes to empower organizations that have worked tirelessly to improve mental health care, such as Relates Malaysia and the Malaysian Mental Health Association, who's also here with us today. Um, Tengku Iman is the international patron of World Mental Health Day 2020. And this invitation was recommended by the World Federation of Mental Health and endorsed by WHO and other United Nations agencies. Um, her journey began modestly three years ago with outreach on mental health. And this resulted in her tenure as Royal Patron of the Mental Illness 
Awareness and Support Association, MIASA, from 2018 to 2020. As the face and ambassador of mental health in Malaysia, she is now leading the National Coalition for, for Mental Wellbeing as its royal patron. So thank you, Tunku Iman, for joining us. Okay. I'd like to also introduce Professor Dr. Dr. Andrew Mohan Raj Chandra Sekaran. Dr. Andrew Mohan Raj served MOH Malaysia for 12 years before taking up an international assignment after the Asian tsunami of 2004. He is a consultant psychiatrist, mental health development advisor, and WHO recognized community mental health expert, um, done pioneering work in the establishment of sustainable psychosocial rehabilitation services in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Timor Leste. And uh, he actually removed physical restraints in people with chronic mental illness in these countries. He came back to Malaysia under the Talent Corporation Program um, 2012. So one of the successful returnees. Thank you, doctor, for coming back to Malaysia and supporting your, your country. Uh, he continues to, to work in mental health. He has been a um, two-term member of Mental Health Promotion Advisory Council at the Ministry of Health. And he's also been recognized internationally at the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, appointed by the Prime Minister and the Acting Minister for Community Development, um, which, in which he served two terms. He has a psychiatric practice now in Mount Chiara, um, and he's also providing mental health services to refugees and asylum seekers uh, whose intended destination is Australia. And recently elected as a member of the Board of Directors of, of the World Federation for Mental Health, and he is the president as um, he is now of the Malaysian Mental Health Association. So um, all of you are very distinguished, and I'm sorry for the long introductions, but I think it's important to set the tone of where you're all at. So YB Michelle Ng, uh, I'd like to invite as well. She was elected at 28 years old as the State Assemblywoman of Subang Jaya. She is currently the youngest assembly person in Selangor. She is the sole um, woman who has been made chairman of a select committee on water resources in Selangor. She is passionate about mental health, uh, water and transport policies. She initiated Care Warriors, a society focused on mental health training and welfare. She's a practicing lawyer, she uh, was a legal associate with Gobind Singh Deal and completed her Bachelor of Laws from LSE and Political Science on a Maxis Scholarship. And finally, last but not least, we have Dr. Nur Ashikin Ibrahim, or a better well known as Dr. Anne. So I'm going to refer to you as Dr. Anne. So Dr. Anne is a medical doctor and public health specialist um, who received her undergraduate training from UM, University of Malaya. And she has been with the Ministry of Health for 26 years. Uh, previously in University Hospital, Sungai Buloh Hospital, Sepang District, she holds now the post of Public Health Physician and sector, he sector Head for Mental Health, Violence, Injury and Substance Abuse, Disease Control Division at the Ministry of Health. She has been involved in mental health for the past 17 years and has received training on mental health and psychological response in disaster in Japan, training on mental health promotion and illness prevention from the Hunter Institute of Mental Health Australia, and training on suicide pre prevention from Australian Institute for Suicide Research and Prevention. She is the focal point for mental health at ASEAN level. So really important, can share with us also regional um, perspectives. She is involved in training on mental health for healthcare providers and, and participates actively in various activities at the community level, writes on mental health articles for several magazines. And her passion is in reading and singing, um, something that would be uh, an interesting thing to learn about. So what I'm going to do is we've got four uh, really experienced panelists and um, I'm going to ask each of them questions, but also feel free to use the time to interact. Then we have all the way up to 12. So we will then uh, take in questions from the audience at perhaps about uh, 11.30 or so. So I think what I'll do is I'll start off with Dr. Anne. So Dr. Anne um, is from the Ministry of Health and, you know, Dr. Anne, we've heard a lot about the statistics and uh, we also know that there's probably under-reporting because of the, the nature of this topic itself. So perhaps you could share with us at the very outset, um, what are some observations that MOH has on the rise in youth suicides during COVID-19? Um, and if you can share, you know, what are the kind of subsequent actions that MOH has taken to address and prevent youth suicides? So I think that sets us off on a good footing and then we can talk about other community initiatives after. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Trisha. Yang mulia tentu, Dr. Andrew, Rabbi Michelle and everyone else. Um, okay, uh, if we talk about suicide uh, prevention in terms of initiatives that uh, Ministry of Health has actually started way back in the way, I think in the year 2004, when if you can remember, it was the first time that uh, we had a theme uh, that means to acknowledge World Suicide Prevention Day in the year 2003, I think. Uh, so basically, the initiatives was already done even then. And I think one of the things that uh, if, you, if you want to talk about data, yes, we do have uh, in terms of uh, reporting, in data reporting, but we have been actually reporting to WHO about our incidents uh, in terms of of uh, data reporting. So basically uh, looking at estimates and also uh, we have actually had a national suicide registry that was actually formed way back in the year uh, mid of 2000, I think in July 2007. And uh, from then we got the, uh, the data as in uh, the rate of suicide initially was between 1.3 to 1.5 per 100,000 population then. But if you look at the youth, of course, uh, uh, in the first place, we've got to get a proper definition of youth because the definition of youth has been also changing, actually. You know, uh, before when we talk about youth, if uh, we understand in Malay, it's called Belia. Uh, I thought you can also say the young people, but it was initially from uh, 20 above 19 uh, because adolescence is 10 to 19 uh, and uh, youth is basically 20 to 40. But now apparently, uh, when you look at the data, uh, now we have actually uh, tried to actually skew it down to 20 to 30 years old. So if you talk about uh, data in youth, uh, I've actually had uh, the, the uh, what do you call, um, the, corpor uh, the corporation atau kerjasama from uh, PDRM recently. I think because uh, we have had engagement. So uh, if you look at uh, the, the data in terms of youth, yeah, if basically... Uh, Okay, in terms of youth, if you look at the percentage, you can compare because we've got the recent data that was actually reported by the uh, Royal Malaysia Police. So basically, if you look from the age of 19 to 40 years old, um, it was about 57% uh, in the year 2020 out of the total case of 631 cases. So uh, if you look at it, it's probably, it, you can say that very high. But uh, if you look at the comparison between 2019, it was only 58%. So uh, the total case that was reported from PDRM, this is the source of PDRM, because when we had the engagement of PDRM, uh, before we are actually uh, uh, proposing or we are actually implementing our National Suicide Registry soon, uh, there was only an, an increase of about 2% from the total cases, that means uh, in the year 2019, it was reported as 609 cases of uh, uh, suicide, that means uh, uh, suicidal, and uh, the total number of cases of 631 cases in the year 2020. So basically, there was only an increase in 2% of the cases, of the total cases, not, not just pertaining to youth. But then, um, what ministry have actually done so far, uh, basically in terms of addressing uh, suicidal behavior. We're not just talking about suicide because we're also talking about suicide ideation. We're talking about suicidal attempt and also the act of suicide itself. Um, basically, uh, we have done quite a bit, I would say. Uh, Ministry of Health also uh, to uh, acknowledge other ministries, uh, mainly Ministry of Education. So basically, one of the things that we have started way, way back in the year 2011 was actually to uh, develop a program in the Ministry of Education that we call as Healthy Mind Program in School or Program in Dasyat Skola. I think Datuk Dr. Andrew would probably remember because uh, Datuk was actually in our Mental Health Promotion Advisory Board. Uh, way back in 2011 when it started. So uh, this particular program initially concentrating of uh, to help teachers and to help the teachers counselors, or uh, in Malay, we call that as guru bimbingan dan counseling to detect uh, students, especially the young age group, uh, the young people who uh, probably uh, has issues of mental health early and to be able to refer them early to get treatment. 
So um, we use uh, screening procedures in the schools, and this is uh, totally been uh, implemented by the teachers, the counselors, and they do have some training. And on top of that, uh, what we are doing is actually, I think one of the one of the things that we have actually looked into uh, is also uh, the development of the Mental Health Promotion Advisory Council, where we get all the members from uh, NGO, basically started with NGO, uh, for example, like uh, initially that Andrew was uh, representing uh, MMHA. And I think we've got, we forget about one, I think uh, Relate has forgotten about one of the most important NGOs that has been there all along to actually provide and promote suicide prevention initiatives, which is the Befrienders, because the Befrienders is actually one of the things that has started way back in the year 1970s. So uh, when we ventured, Ministry of Health ventured into the suicide prevention initiatives, we even had uh, 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 these programs initiated. The Mental Health Promotion Advisory uh, Board actually roped in uh, other ministries that are relevant ministries that has been mentioned in your presentation, which is the Ministry of, Educa uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Youth and Sports, we had representative from there, also Ministry of Women, Family and Development. So uh, along that line, uh, we also uh, develop uh, what we call as uh, um, other other initiatives to actually um, promote uh, mental health uh, wellness in youth. For example, we have what we call as the PROCIS program in the uh, universities or in the higher educations. Uh, and we are extending the Healthy Mind program in schools to, uh, to um, actually uh, cover the areas of suicide prevention. So with that, I think the Ministry of Education also works with psychiatrists in the education field and also in the Ministry of Health, not just psychiatrists, our counsellors, our public health, our family medicine specialists, which is another fraternity that probably people may not know that is actually doing a lot of job in actually uh, doing suicide prevention. So that is in on our part. And uh, one of the things that we also are looking into is actually um, to actually um, match the needs and gaps assessment at the primary health care. So what we have done now is actually, uh, to tell you, Tricia, we have actually developed a lot of things like the training module at the community level. We have our even our media reporting that was actually stated there. And we also have even our guideline in terms of uh, prevention of suicide management. So there's a lot has been actually done, but I think one of the things, uh, and the other thing is uh, when you say about, I saw the report and I think uh, one of the things that the key recommendations that has been highlighted in the uh, report, in your report, has actually uh, taken a lot of uh, place for the past many, many years that we have been doing, of course, uh, and also awareness campaigns, for example, like uh, we are embarking on the Let's Talk campaign that has been actually launched in the year 2019. And uh, that has actually uh, taken into place uh, to ensure that all agencies and other organizations also uh, talk in the same field or in the same uh, platform in the sense that we, uh, the talk itself, you know, is actually tell someone about your problem, uh, ask for help, you know, listen without judgment and know where to seek help. I think a lot of people, uh, as uh, Dr. Sokning was ex ex explaining that um, awareness has passed. They said, she says awareness has passed, but I still think that uh, you need to have awareness because in the sense that you need to target to the specific group, for example, like um, now the gaps, for example, looking in the community, you need to target community leaders. You need to target religious leaders. You know, if, for example, we are the ones who know about mental health, we are talking about it, yes, but that has not gone through the community leaders and the religious leaders because the youth, they do not come directly to the healthcare facility. They do not come to see a doctor to tell you that I do have issues. I have mental health problems or I have issues that is related at home. And one of the things that I think uh, one of the risk factors that was not mentioned was one of it was substance abuse. That is actually uh, because in the year 2007 to 2010, when we did our national suicide registry then, we found that 30% of the people who committed suicide was actually related with substance abuse. And uh, that is one area that we need to also look into. And uh, having said that, um, uh, I think, uh, sorry, Tricia, just a little bit more. I know I'm, I'm uh, the media part, I think that we'll need uh, more engagement 
So, uh, so I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Anne, thank you so much for sharing all the wonderful things that you're doing. And it's great that you have um, not just like the, the training module, but also like the media guidelines and so on. So, I mean, there's evidently recognition of the problem, I think. So, um, but wondering just very quickly before I move on to the others, uh, maybe you can share what are the lessons that, that you think have been learned from all of these range of programs over the years and like um, what are the effectiveness of them? I mean, I'm sure some have been more effective, some less effective. So what do you think on hindsight um, would need to improve based on, on the slate of events and programs that you've already done? Okay, uh, just a quick one. I think one of the things we need to materialize the de decriminalization of suicidal attempt, suicide attempt. Yeah, that, that is one effort that uh, probably is a little bit beyond Ministry of Health. But uh, the fact that even if we don't decriminalize it. One of the things that I think the mental health expert would like to have is actually to ensure that those people who are actually detained or taken into after they have been actually taken by the royal police to be brought to the police custody, they uh, must not be treated as uh, penjanaya. That's one of the things, you know, uh, that means uh, they must not be convicted and things like that. So that is one of the effort that has to go through. And of course, it has to go through parliament. There's so many issues and so many things that we need to address. The other things is like uh, campaigns, I think uh, more targeted for this year. I think we have realized that uh, we need to target, we need to uh, not generalize the campaign, but target to youth and probably working adults. So uh, that is one of the things that we are working into uh, in the ministry. Uh, not to say that we, we do not have our weaknesses. We do have our weaknesses, but we hope that uh, working together because we need the involvement on, uh, I think at the community level, Trisha, we need to strengthen at the community, community level because when they go to the hospital, there's no doubt psychiatrists will see them, you know, psychologists will see them and then they are being brought home. But within that time span that when uh, these particular people who are at high risk of suicide uh, actually stays at home, who's looking after them? So uh, these are the things that we need to address. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think it's really important um, to, to talk about these issues openly and transparently. I mean, um, not talking about it actually sends it into the shadows, which makes it much more stigmatized and uh, exactly right, getting to community efforts. But I'm really glad that you brought up already at the beginning of this conversation, the need to decriminalize suicide. So that's also been highlighted in the report. And I don't see why a sort of bipartisan effort could not um, already take place like within parliament. I mean, this is something that I'm sure can be easily taken up as, as a campaign. So it's interesting what we can talk about maybe following from today, what else can be done. But I'd like to um, go from, you know, MOH and all the established programs that we've done over the years into someone who's doing something in a relatively new uh, way. So maybe I bring in Tanku Iman right now, um, who has been working um, with her Green Ribbon Society. And you can maybe share with us a little bit about the Green Ribbon Society, why you started it. And I think you've also been of having a working group on decriminalizing attempted suicide through your efforts. So, um, Tanku Iman, we would love to hear from you. Yeah, um, morning, um, afternoon, morning, everyone. Yeah, so I just um, want to say thanks everyone for having me and wanted to introduce a bit more about the Green Ribbon. Um, I would like to um, start by saying that this group does not wish to replicate existing mental health initiatives that are already in place. Um, rather, we aim to empower organizations and, and those who have been working tirelessly on mental health care. So like to give a voice to the voiceless, you know, we're not there to, to be the new uh, MMHA or the new Miasa. No, we're here to say MMHA, this is what MMHA has been doing. Go, you know, read, you know, I want to redirect people to there or, you know, I mean, because some people aren't aware, like, I think Vice Navish was talking about how Miasa, I mean, Miasa has been doing these work, this work and, and, and Linda Kami, but fortunately they are young enough to be able to know how to handle social media and how to reach the, um, the youth. Whereas we, 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 we sometimes forget organizations like the MMHA who have been there from the 1960s, you know, maybe they're not as, maybe they're older, so they, they're not as tech savvy. So yeah, I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just talk about what's happening now with the green ribbon and whatever. It's also, let's give that recognition to those who have been doing it since the 60s and the 70s, you know, and, and MOH and all this, these um, initiatives that we don't know about, because do we really, uh, have we really searched, done a proper search on what MOH has done? 
why is it why is it just MOH who has to you know um, talk about what they've been doing? It has to be a collected effort, I think, is which is what I'm trying to say as a green ribbon group. You know, we we kind of want to connect what's already out there rather than start new things because I think the things that need to be to, that that are needed are already there. We're just not looking hard enough. We're not connecting everyone. So that's where we as a Green Ribbon kind of uh, want to fit in. I want to see, I mean, I want people to know that we're, we're not here to replace anyone. We're just sort of aggregating everyone, bringing everyone together, connecting everyone, because the initiatives that we are looking for and trying to create are actually already there. We just kind of need to, you know, implement them at the right time, the right, you know, in the right way. And it has to be a collected effort from everyone, not just MOH not just MMHA, not just ideas, and not just us. It should be from, you know, from the, the, the people, from the youth, from the elderly, from, you know, I mean, everyone has to make that collected effort to push this agenda forward. And that's where we stand, at, that's our role. I, I feel that um, that's what the Green Ribbon is aiming to do and is currently sort of doing, yeah. Thank you so much, Tengku Iman. And then um, a kind of follow-up question as well. So I think we are here talking about youth suicide and I think you're probably um, on the panel, uh, the rest of us are very elderly uh, by the youth definition already. And, right. um, you know, just reflecting on the report and the presentation that was uh, given to us just now, yeah. how do you feel that COVID-19 um, has exacerbated the existing problems that, and the pressures and the stresses that the youth uh, believe that they are facing? Yeah, I think that, um, I always say this, that um, COVID has made the anxious, the non-anxious anxious and the anxious more anxious. So as someone who's personally anxious, it's made me more anxious. But those who didn't believe in anxiety suddenly think, oh my gosh, it's actually really real. And, you know, those who used to kind of like laugh at it and say it's not an issue, mental health is not an issue, are now saying to me that, oh my gosh, Iman, you were right. You know, this thing that you were talking about is, it's there. I'm like, yeah, you know, finally, you know, so that I feel like that's the silver lining um, from COVID, you know, as much as it's obviously the worst thing that's happened, you know, one of the worst things ever in the history of the whole world to happen. Um, it's also a, a blessing because we see what's really important and mental health has sort of taken the forefront. Um, finally, I think it's long overdue, but finally people who are not, who don't believe in mental health and mental health exists, finally see the importance of how, if, you know, how it is, you know, um, how it takes, a, how mental health takes a toll on your physical health. And, you know, you see kids not being able to go to school and then there's a lack of interaction with, which then, you know, you know, uh, the, you know, so that makes them anxious and then they become lonely, you know, all sorts, you know, you see the youth now very affected and, you know, now like I feel like everyone's living in this virtual world, you know, where, where, you know, it's actually normal for kids to go to school and, you know, interact, have social interaction, but now that everything's on the computer, which is, it's not very good for kids, I think, because as humans, we should be interacting with one another in person, not over the virtual, I think the virtual, you know, it's not, I don't think it's very good for the brain. I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but I feel like even for my son as a mom, I don't want him to, to be overusing the iPad because I know it's not good for, for their eyesight, for their brain. You know, it's, it's so, it must be very, you know, shout out to moms out there who have to homeschool their kids. And, you know, the whole virtual thing is, it's, it's wow. I, you know, so that's taking, you know, I think kids as young as six are, you can see the impact of the pandemic on them as well, you know, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, as a parent myself, I share those concerns. And on top of that, uh, my primary concern now also as a leader of an organization, and we only just have a small staff size of 25, uh, my primary concern is the, the mental well-being of everyone. Uh, some of them, you know, live at home and in complete isolation. What will this actually mean for the work that not just we do, but for the work um, of all of the, the various companies out there as well? So uh, thank you, Tengku Iman, and I will come back to you in a short while. But now I'd like to go back again to, uh, I think Tengku Iman stressed the importance of organizations like the MMHA. So the Malaysian Mental Health Association has been around for many decades already. And that's what Dr. Andrew, I'm sure you're already, you're carrying on the tradition of an organization that has been in existence for a long time. But maybe you can share with us, what are some of the ground experiences that you have had with youth suicide in Malaysia? And in your view, 
um, and based on this experience, what are the gaps in youth suicide prevention and what do we need to do? I mean, that's kind of a lot of questions in one and then I'll come up with a follow-up question after. So yes, go. Thank oh. you. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, that is quite a loaded question, I must say, simply because MMHA is, is just one organization uh, and, and we try to do as much as we can. And, and as Tenkuputri Iman had uh, pointed out just now, uh, I think it, for us to be effective in mainstreaming mental health issues, particularly youth mental health issues, we need to all, all, of, all come together. Uh, and that's what uh, Pursatwan Green Ribbon is doing. And now Tunku Putri as the royal patron for the uh, Mental Health Coalition is attempting to do. So coming uh, to MMHA, our, our activities have always been uh, a sort of twin. Uh, we took a twin track approach and one, one track is obviously advocacy. And uh, we have been uh, uh, doing that quite actively for a number of decades, actually. And uh, the other track is to provide services. Now, when you talk about youth-centered services, and, and, and I must say largely our activities are youth-centered, um, uh, traditionally we have provided rehabilitation services for mainly youth uh, with chronic mental illness. Um, and, uh, and that would also, of course, include um, you know, uh, uh, services or include the participation of the caregivers in looking at warning signs of suicide and how to prevent suicide. So that has been a very approach with our clients. Um, but now, and uh, as Tanko Putri had just now rightly pointed out, COVID seems to have changed a lot of things. And it is also, there was a silver lining in this and we have now decided to, to reach out to as many people as possible, given the, the limited resources that we have. And one important step towards this is the introduction of the Mental Health First Aid Program, which is a training program that we have introduced to anyone who is interested in understanding uh, mental health issues and, and, and using this understanding and this knowledge to care for somebody else with mental health issues or just work in the area of uh, mental health. And uh, for specifically for youth, there is a, a special uh, 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 program within this uh, 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 mental health first aid, which targets adolescents and youth with an emphasis on uh, suicide prevention. So we are hoping to roll that program out so that we can reach out to as many people as possible. In addition to that, we also have our own uh, 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 online uh, services and hotline as well, um, where people can dial in or reach us online uh, to discuss issues with uh, regards to youth mental health. And, uh, and of course, uh, along with that, we do have people reaching out to us uh, as a sort of a cry for help when they are suicidal or they have suicidal thoughts. Um, so this is what that, that, that we, have, we are doing in terms of services. But as I said, there is another track as well, and that is advocacy. And advocacy is something that we have been doing for quite a long time. Uh, just now, I think uh, Atunku uh, Zain also mentioned about the role of, of media. Um, and uh, Vaishnavi as well mentioned about media being responsible in terms of reporting. MMHA has done uh, some substantial work in this. And I'm happy to say that our mainstream media has responded to our call very responsibly, uh, really. And there are guidelines with, regarding, with regards to reporting. And I must say, generally speaking, our mainline, uh, mainstream media has, has subscribed to these recommendations. In fact, they, they, uh, they are particularly careful as not to over-sensationalize uh, the reports, as well as to provide uh, information as to where people who have distress uh, can reach out to, for example, befrienders. And, uh, and of late, we have also included 
our own uh, MMHA services in this. So that is the kind of advocacy that uh, one example of advocacy that we have been doing. Along with that, we have, as Dr. Nurashikin mentioned just now, that we have been uh, a member of the uh, Mental Health Promotion Council. Um, I have been a member of the National Council for Disabilities as well, where we use our expertise to, to uh, mainstream mental health issues and assist people, particularly those with chronic mental illness. Uh, for example, in, uh, in, in uh, obtaining the CART OKU for people with chronic mental illness. A lot of work has gone into this um, uh, to, to realize um, this, um, uh, the, the rights of people with, uh, with chronic mental illness. And uh, recently we have also um, engaged in uh, uh, other, with, with other organizations and with Tunkaputri in particular, with regards to decriminalizing uh, suicide. And I noticed that the presenters earlier emphasized a lot on decriminalizing uh, suicide. And, and we do agree, uh, MMHA uh, and uh, its partners also agree that the time has come to have a relook at, um, at, at, at the um, our criminal procedure code um, and, and, to, and, and perhaps to, to rethink as to how we can go about having a different perspective of this act. Now, we do understand that repealing of the act may not be, uh, would be ideal, but at the same time, we also feel that our approach must be based on consensus and uh, if there is a possibility to, uh, if not to repeal, at least to amend that act, is something that we are working uh, uh, towards. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I must also add here that while there is a universal feeling that the act must be repealed or amended, I think the feeling is that it should be repealed altogether. I would also like to point out here that part of our advocacy strategy is to, 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 uh, uh, to let others know, to let every stakeholder know that there are provisions within the Mental Health Act, um, existing Mental Health Act, to look into this or to give a more humane approach to in, in, in this um, uh, uh, in, in, in trying to uh, uh, criminalize suicide and to emphasize the fact that people generally, people who attempt suicide are victims and should, should not be seen as a perpetrator of a crime. So there are provisions in the Mental Health Act, for example, for the judicial, the presiding judicial officer to order an individual to have a psychiatric assessment. And even if, if there is a punitive aspect to it, the Mental Health Act actually takes a very a lenient approach towards this, that in the sense that the period of assessment can, can be considered a part of the punitive action. Uh, I, I'm not advocating that, of course, and certainly we are looking at, you know, we, we understand the basic principle that people who attempt suicide are the victims here, and that cannot be compromised in any way. But there are other elements to consider as well. For example, people who encourage others to, to, to attempt suicide. Um, uh, you know, the act also looks into that and there should not be compromise in, in, in that, uh, in, in taking punitive actions against people who encourage others uh, to commit suicide, for example. So that's the kind of approach that we are taking given the fact that there are sensitivities, cultural, religious sensitivities as well around this. And what we would like to emphasize also is that in terms of awareness, as Dr. Nurashikin said, the, the, the battle isn't over yet. We need to still continue with uh, emphasis on, on, on awareness. And part of this awareness is also targeted towards stigma associated with accessing mental health care. And by working in that area and improving access to mental health care, mental health services, that indirectly also would decrease uh, uh, suicide rates. Uh, and, and these are the, the, the things that we have been doing. And, and one other thing that I must also point out, for example, we spoke a lot about the Indian community just now and, and the rates of suicide within the community. Uh, while that is, that's absolutely true now, but a lot of work has gone on 
towards, for example, uh, uh, removing access or to to you know uh, to the method of suicide, for example, uh, uh, removing or restricting access to to insect uh, uh, pesticides, for example, in 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 the in in Cameron Highlands uh, area has seen a drastic reduction in the rates of suicide among the Indian community. Um, so these are the things in terms of advocacy that MMHA does. But as it was pointed out by Tanku Putri and Tanku Zain just now, um, fact is that we must all come together uh, because MMHA alone obviously can't do things alone. For Sato and Green Ribbon alone can't do things on its own. Uh, we must all come together and, and use our, our advantages uh, in, a, in a collaborative manner. Thank you. Um, so, so that's about all. Yes. Thank you thank so you. much. Andrew. Perfect timing. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so yeah, I think the common theme here is that everyone needs to come together and uh, you know community efforts and so on. And I, I'm also uh, glad that Dr. Ann earlier mentioned the importance of PDRM, right? Because ultimately they are the ones who have to deal with a lot of these cases. And it's important that they also adopt this humane approach that Dr. Andrew says um, is contained already in the Mental Health Act. But um, now I'd just like to move to YB Michelle Eng. I'm so sorry that you're definitely last but not least. You've been working very closely with the community on the issue of youth suicide and uh, within Subang Jaya Community Wellness Program. So can you tell us what are some of the takeaways and what are the you know, main risk factors that are driving youth suicide from your experience on the ground, both during as well as before the pandemic? Okay. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about how um, we came to, to this position, we as in Care Warriors. Um, it's not, it's actually an organization that was just registered. Um, and what we do actually was reverse engineered. I didn't um, actually come out saying that we need an organization to do this. It was from solving a problem to realizing that you need a platform to actually coming about with this program. Um, so as, as background, Subang Jaya is actually a very, um, educated community. Uh, we also have a very high student population with five private universities situated in the constituency. Um, and from my experience, especially after the 2018 elections, um, I actually saw a very startling trend where almost um, every month or every other month, um, I personally will be attending to either uh, uh, attempted suicide or a case where unfortunately suicide was successful. Um, I recall very vividly after a month or two after the 2018 elections. And you know, as, as politicians, we, we are invited to weddings and funerals. And the first funeral I attended was of a young person. And the cause of death was suicide. And the person that referred the case to me was actually one of our supporters. And so it was very, um, emotional in a sense that you don't know what to say uh, in, in cases like this. You don't know how, and, and it was the first case as well, what you needed to do in a funeral like that. All I could do was sit there and listen. And as I listened, I realized that um, there was a gap that needed to be filled. And it, it arose from a question of, you know, I wish I knew what to do. And I wish I knew what to do. This question was posed uh, by people who were related to the disease. And they felt that, you know, were, were there things that I could have done better? Um, were there things that I should have known? And that was a question that I tried to see whether, you know, there was an answer to. And as I dug further in trying to address this, this, this problem, um, I realized that there are things out there that perhaps can be put together uh, to increase mental health literacy, especially. Um, and as I did that, I realized what uh, Dr. Dr. Andrew was uh, talking about, which was stigma. And many people talk about how we need to make sure that our message goes out to those who are affected, families that are affected, yeah. you know, communities that are affected. Yet you have this layer that actually prevents them from even coming out and saying that I am facing this problem because society looks down upon them. So how then do you, how then do you find them if they, they are not willing to come out themselves? So recognizing the landscape, what we decided to do was 
um, aim for a trickle down approach. And what I realized, which is quite special to the Malaysian landscape, is that our communities are actually very organized. We have Ketua Kampongs, we have Penghulus, we have residence associations, we have Rukun Tetangas, we have churches, mosques, temples, and these can serve as very good entry points and, and, and ways that we can engage community leaders so that they serve as a reference point um, for the people around them. And when the people around them know that my leader is trained in mental health literacy, they are more, more comfortable approaching someone like that than going to an institution, than, than going to perhaps a hospital or a psychiatrist for fear of the stigma. And then you create an environment that is safe uh, where community leaders would bring them towards help. Now, um, that's the reason why we focus on mental health literacy. One, uh, on just increasing awareness of what kind of behavioral changes that you should look out for, what kind of verbal changes that you should look out for in a way that people like you and me uh, who are not professionally trained can pick up very easily and be more sensitive to it. And arising from that, uh, the community actually said that they wanted more in a sense of early intervention. So they said, Michelle, what you are doing is good, but you're addressing something at the tail end where a problem has already arose. Can we talk more about something that is more preventive, something that is earlier, where we build resilience within our young people um, so as to ensure they do not fall into um, mental illness, that they do not, that they are able to cope better with their mental health. Um, and so that is where we got together a group of professionals to start thinking about that. Can we come up with a module um, to increase resilience, to change a problem-focused mindset to a more solution-oriented mindset? Um, and we were fortunate to get uh, Dr. Tan and Dr. Intan to come up with this module to roll out in the universities in Subang Jaya. And we're very happy to see that it has been successful and very, very well received. Now, um, just addressing your question, Trisha, uh, about what perhaps are the triggers um, that might lead young people towards suicide. I can say that there are so many actually, very varied. Of course, um, one, uh, what, what, what I see, especially in the age group, um, is that there, there is a lot of changes that they are facing in their lives, especially the transition from primary school to secondary school and secondary school to tertiary education. More so from secondary school to tertiary education, where it requires them to come out uh, of their comfort zone, especially if they travel from other states. Suddenly, they are overwhelmed with a new system, a new education system, a new environment, new friends, new teachers, um, you know, being away from home, homesickness. Uh, if they come from a, a, a poor financial background, then you know there's this additional factor to deal with. Um, suddenly they're discovering relationships, you know. Um, suddenly they're discovering that there's these complexities in relationships that they struggle to handle. Um, so it's varied. I, I can't say that there is exactly one that is more prominent than the other. I think um, all of them are facing different issues at different points. Um, but what I can say is that what is common in all of this. Um, is the process of adapting to various types of changes that are happening around them, uh, where they need support to be able to cope better with that, uh, which is why we felt that coming in with resilience training would be able to also address that problem. I think I want to emphasize what um, Putri and also uh, Dr. Andrew said, that we are not here to duplicate efforts out there. And that is why uh, for Care Warriors, we never talk about going into what MMHA is doing because we can't. We don't have the professional resources and we don't want duplicity because they are already, already doing a good job. Um, we don't want to talk about too much about advocacy because they are also doing a good job. There's so many people out there who are already doing it. Um, that is why when we look at literacy, mental health literacy, education, um, that is where we found our space. One thing that I'm quite interested in working on arising from the conversation today um, is suicide response for our agencies, agencies being um, our firefighters and also our policemen. What Dr. Dr. Andrew highlighted was something very interesting because if you look at the Mental Health Act, especially in Section 10, uh, you will see that the police are empowered uh, to do um, uh, involuntary hospital admission. Um, this is something that we are testing out in Subang Jaya. Uh, for the attempted suicide cases that come through my door, I make an effort to engage 
the fire department, they are the first responders, after a successful rescue to engage the police and convince them of their powers under Section 10 and use that instead of Section 309, which is um, the, the provision in the penal code that addresses uh, the criminalization of suicide. Um, we have seen success in that. We do see that the police are sympathetic, are empathetic, and they too want to know what is a better solution to this. So seeing that it has produced success in Subang Jaya, I'm wondering whether we can come up with a better suicide response that is institutionalized and formalized so as to fill in that gap. There is so much of a concern if we do remove Section 309 of the Penal Code. I think there is potential. I think we should work on it. Um, in Subang Jaya, we have seen success, and I do want to see that implemented throughout the entire country. Thank yeah, you. That's all from me. Thank you so much, uh, YB Michelle. I mean, you've touched on so many important things, and I think what I, I also want to do at this point is ask uh, Dr. Chua Sokning and Vice Navi to just come back on on the video. Um, you talked about YB Michelle, um, you know, mental health literacy, resilience training, suicide response. And I know uh, Tanku Iman has uh, something to respond to, but before going to you, uh, Dr. Chua, I wanted to just get your thoughts because you mentioned in your presentation or in your opening remarks, I can't remember, um, the importance of emotional regulation. So this is a term that I only started to know about as a parent because, um, you know, this is something that we have to start very young, training our children to have, to be able to regulate their emotions early. And I don't think this is something that even adults know how to do really. So could I get your perspective of this? Like, what do you think builds better resilience in human beings, whether children, youth, or adults? And how does this relate to um, being able to prevent at a very early stage, um, you know, thoughts of suicide or any kinds of thoughts of distress? Right. I, I would mention first that, you know, just general thoughts of death is actually quite common, right? Like, I mean, I think... Well, I won't speak for everyone, but I'll say a lot of people uh, I know, and the, the research certainly shows this, that it's it's common to consider life is not worth living or to have moments of hopelessness or to have moments of distress, you know, that, um, so that there's certain normativeness to that without stigmatizing anyone and saying, you know, like these people is, have something wrong with them. The emotional regulation piece, um, and actually, we have a podcast on that um, by F Dr. Fred. Uh, he really talks about, you know, what do we do with our emotions? Now, I won't generalize it to only Asians, but in general, the Asian culture doesn't really teach people what to do with their emotions, right? So, in fact, if you show anything other than maybe a positive emotion, they'll say, don't be angry, yeah? you know, like don't cry, you know, you cry, yeah? You go outside, you know, so it kind of gives you the message that I think feeling sad or crying or even being angry is not normal and deserves to be sort of like you handle it on your own, right? It, 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 it instills that message even from a very young age that negative emotions are not allowed. It's not allowed to be expressed. In fact, they should be completely pushed away. But there are healthy expressions of emotions. These are part of the, the full experience of being a human, right? Anger tell, and, and emotions tell us, man, I'm going on this like teaching thing, but emotions are cool because they tell us about what we need in life. Anger tells us that we have, that there's been a transgression that happened to us. Sadness tells us we have a loss, you know, fear tells us there is a threat. And if we don't understand what our, that, that our emotions are actually our friends, and then how to respond to them in a healthy way, it will pile up. The more we push them down, we leak out emotions and then it bursts out of us. So part of emotional regulation is learning to recognize your emotions, label them, accept them, and be able to respond to them in a healthy way. Now, if you've ever watched the movie Inside Out, which is where a lot of psychologists should get your education from. <laughs> but it's my favorite movie. Inside Out, you like remember the little girl who was like kind of sad, you know, but then if you watch, you know, it plays on and she got comfort. And so that's what sadness needs. Sadness needs comfort. But if we don't recognize that, we won't get it soothed. So pay attention to emotions by, by recognizing, accepting, and then seeing where, what does it, what does it need? You know, what, what, 
what do I need to do to get these um, emotions soothed in a healthy way? Thank you so much, Dr. Chua. So that's uh, her little piece from the clinical <laughs> psychologist side. But I think it's really important. And I like what YB Michelle is doing on the resilience training. I think that's really fundamental. It's, it's important for uh, dealing with the interpersonal issues, which we found in the paper and has been mentioned several times is a leading factor uh, for suicide. But I think Tanku Iman had something to say. And while she speaks, I also want to say that we have so many questions. I am so sorry, I won't be able to address all of them. I know that Dr. Chua is answering some of them as we speak. So um, I will try and select a couple and sort of theme them together. And we might go a little bit overboard uh, in terms of time, but bear with us. And Tanku Iman, over to you. No, I just, I, I, I want to say that I've met YB Michelle before and I love what you do. I think you're very genuine and, you know, amazing. I love all your work. But, you know, this resilience training and whatnot, I just just want to ask, I just wanted to ask Dr. Anne, didn't, was it, weren't there modules introduced before? Or was it just, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, from what I've read, I was just, what well, I wanted to ask, this is just a question to Dr. Anne. Okay. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, Tinku. Uh, okay. There, there actually. Um, I mean, um, MOH has actually produced a lot of modules. Among them are mental health, uh, life skills. You know, for targeted for uh, kanak kana for uh, children, adolescent, young, uh, for adults, working adults, and even for elderly. But in terms of implementation, I think we are getting. Uh, can you hear me? Because uh, it's. Perfect. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So uh, basically, in terms of implementation, I think uh, what we are looking at now as uh, we are looking at the setbacks that we need to work more with the uh, NGOs or people who are at the ground to implement because uh, at this point of time, I think our healthcare system is also at stretched. In, yeah. in terms that uh, we are not just now doing mental health, but we are also uh, uh, doing putting our feet into COVID management and things like that. So basically, but uh, I think I would be happy to share that uh, because uh, recently I've shared actually uh, most of the modules that we have with the uh, coalition, with the mental health coalition. And uh, I think even the NGOs, some of them has actually done their modules. So uh, thank you, YB Michelle, for initiating a lot of work that you've done. Uh, and... Um, only that for Ministry of Health, uh, it is basically uh, one of the aim is actually to integrate mental health into the normal general well-being. So basically, when we do our modules, we're not just concentrating on uh, delivering uh, about just about mental health resilience, but we're also talking about healthy lifestyles. So that's why it came, it came to about like uh, it is not seen, for example, as a, a module that's just zooming into mental health. But it's more like, uh, you know, uh, doing exercises because exercises are also related to good mental health, you know, and uh, eating well and yeah. then non-smoking, substance abuse and things like that. Yeah. So uh, answering to that, uh, YB, I think uh, YB and uh, uh, Tenku and also everyone else, I think modules are already there. You just have to actually tap in. And there's a lot of resources uh, in the portal My Health, probably because because uh, it's not just zooming into mental health, it's just over general of a Ministry of Health portfolio. So I think that that's where we probably need to make it friendly. Um, maybe a little bit, is it okay to share? Can I just continue a little bit more? Because uh, uh, I just want to uh, inform that one of the things uh, just now, I just wanted to comment when uh, Dato was saying about the importance, Dato Andrew, importance of media. And I think MMHC has do, been doing a lot also in media engagement. Uh, actually, we have actually monitored, you know, for the past in the year 2020, between 2020 and 2019, I think there was about more than 2,000 of media reporting on suicidal behavior, whether be it on papers or social media. Only 8% of that out of that 2,000 reporting that actually reported or uh, highlighted where to seek help. So I think uh, that, that is one of the areas we need to work with, uh, whether it be MP, MCMC or Commentary on Penerangan, you know, um, the people who are actually uh, looking into social media. So, um, and also uh, media as a whole. Uh, because one of the challenges that we are facing, because media is not covered by one body. There is no, uh, you know, you have to contact, for example, if you have uh, uh, the writing media, uh, you have to uh, you have to contact them. You have uh, TV, you have radio, you have it's all different by different entity. So we have to get the journalists, especially the editors. 
because uh, sometimes journalists or reporters they will write but if the editors do not agree so uh, we ourselves or many others can't do much about it so i think uh, engagement and uh, it's not just ministry of health i think we 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 are very very much lucky to have so many people involved and uh, one of the things that we have initiated last year during the covid pandemic to establish a technical working group uh, uh, elected by the Ministry of Health, consisting of uh, many, many experts from different fraternities, including the NGOs. Uh, okay. So uh, I think we are moving forward, hopefully. Yep. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to address some of the questions now, and I'm going to try and group them for time. So I want to go into school. Yep. There is a question here about screening programs and mental health issue detection in schools. And this person who's anonymous saying that back in high school, the psychometric test we did indicated that a quarter of the class had signs of mental health issues, but none of us were called into counselling. Um, how can we measure the effectiveness of these programmes and how can we make sure that they are put into action? And I want to link that a little with another question um, that's addressed to Tanku Iman, but I think anyone can answer this, about cyberbullying. So we know that, um, okay, so when you're young, okay, you go to school and maybe if the school counselling services are not actually offering the appropriate services and then you go home and then you're like online and I think the paper that is now published on the website you can read it it starts with an introduction of, of a case of where a girl actually posed that question to her viewers or to her followers like whether or not to take her own life and so uh, we don't know or I don't know the context of that but I think I just want to ask uh, on, on behalf of this person is cyberbullying something that could cause depression and suicide so let's talk about schools for the moment um, any one of you can respond. Oh, go ahead. Uh, maybe Tanku, you can answer about the. You you want to answer first, or you want me to? I mean, I, I'm not not her, but I would like to say that I I the question is sorry. What was the question that is cyberbullying? Uh, cyberbullying and depression. Uh -huh. I mean, for sure. I mean, we. I think the right. You know, as this the cases are of depression and suicide, are, I mean, I'm speaking very generally here, they're, they're going up because we have so much access to social media. And I feel like the young ones are like, you know, um, on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter, and then you're just over accessed. And I think we should, you know, and then there's, there's a lot of cyberbullying now because there's a lack of practice on social media etiquette. I think that we should educate um, our, our kids out there also how to be on social media. Don't be, you know, you know, to, to be a certain way and not to, you know, like just bully and just be, you know, more positive on social media, not try and not be so negative, you know, because I feel like kids now are just growing up too fast as well because, you know, they're just open to a whole new world. So yeah, I do feel like it, it does contribute to depression and suicide. I mean, I don't know, the doctors can answer this. Thank you, thank you, Iman. I think there's research also, a lot more research is done um, in the US, right? Because there's just a lot more data available there. I think the research does show that um, girls are more susceptible to, uh, to, to mental health issues related to social media because they tend to compare uh, themselves a lot more. But uh, again, the doctors here can answer more. But can we go back to the question of schools um, and yeah. kind of programs that, yeah, YB? I, I, I just want to highlight, I think that part of um, what we need to do better is the ratio of counselling teachers to students. Um, the, the last set of data that I got, and I think perhaps Dr. N or the Ministry of Education might have the updated stats, but um, in 2018-2019, in uh, for primary school, we were looking at one counselling teacher to 350 students. For secondary school, one counselling teacher to 500 students. The healthy ratio is one counselling teacher to 250 students. So um, that might explain a little bit about why um, while you might have been screened, why wasn't counselling a follow-up? I think it's a capacity issue, uh, one. Two, I think what, what uh, Dr. N and the Ministry of Education is doing is very good um, in a sense of empowering our counselling teachers to be able to identify um, signs of uh, uh, mental health challenges. Uh, having said that, from my experience on the ground, I think we need to expand it beyond counselling teachers for all teachers. Um, because counselling teachers can only do so much. Your day-to-day -day teachers for each subject will be able to identify better because they are in a class with that student 
for a longer duration, uh, for a longer period as well. Um, and different teachers from our personal experience as well will have different relationships with students, um, some closer, some not. And I think that is also potential that we need to tap into uh, because you know, when, when you know someone better, you'll be able to know and identify signs better as well. Um, and I do see that there is also fear um, in teachers on the ground uh, to recognize that these, these issues does exist in school for fear that teachers or higher ups might punish them for what is happening because they might be seen to be mismanaging and therefore contributing to the mental health state of mind of the child. Um, so there are various things that we need to work on capacity um, and also just stigma within our education system as well. Uh, we need to create a safer environment for our teachers to be able to perform uh, better in, in, in this area. Uh, thank you very can much. Can I say something as well? Um, okay, I, uh, can you do a quick one? Because that's there. Yeah, very quickly. Okay, now uh, this touching on the topic of cyberbullying, obviously we, we now recognize the fact that bullying has shifted from the traditional bullying where everything was visible and matters were settled because it was all physical. Uh, you know, I'm talking about school uh, bullying at primary school or secondary school. Of late, we have been seeing cases. In fact, even children as young as eight and nine are having suicidal thoughts because they have been bullied, cyber bullied. Um, and I think parents easily tend to blame schools for this and this news, you know, the school environment for this. But parents also should take some initiative in ensuring, as Tanku Iman just now mentioned, to watch and monitor their children. And one such effort that has been quite successful in some parts of the world is the fact that when there is a campaign to say that, to tell the children that if they can't make positive comments on someone else and their friends, uh, don't make any comments. So you can't prevent them from getting into online activities or talking about things and interacting. You know, that era, I think that's a bit difficult to do that now. Uh, but what can happen is if you tell your kids that, okay, you want access uh, online, you want freedom to be online and, and, you know, and interact with your friends, the rule is no negative comments. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. Um, I want to go a little bit... Uh, yeah. uh, Trisha, I think I need to say something about the health, uh, the program in school. Sorry, uh, as as uh, we've said, I think we are also looking at, uh, for example, as what YB Misha was saying, you need to go beyond the teacher counselor because I I have been working with the education and also the counseling teachers uh, for the past like more than how many years, many many years ago, and I find I I actually feel their struggles in the sense that. Uh, you need in, in terms of actually making sure that the mental well-being of the whole warga sekolah, that means the whole school, is not just about the teacher-student uh, ratio. Because uh, I think we uh, the, the efforts to educate uh, the existing, whatever teachers who are actually uh, doing other things rather than just counselling. Because the teachers in counselling, they do all sorts of things. Anything that is not related to academic, uh, the pure academic is actually being given to the teachers of counselling. And they are doing a good job. So basically, uh, if, for example, uh, from your anonymous uh, writer or uh, uh, the person who's questioning, uh, that means why, are, why is he being not follow up after the uh, screening? Probably, I think uh, there is some, uh, when you do the screening, you know, in the schools, there are some uh, categories. For example, certain categories uh, are being followed up by the counsellors. But sometimes uh, we are actually dealing with also uh, people who are actually not uh, being given, uh, not to say the opportunity, but sometimes there are hindrance. For example, families. Sometimes when they want to be referred, but, uh, you know, uh, because back to the stigma. So I think the whole of the system, uh, we need to actually look into it. And one of, the way, uh, one of the things that I think is important is not just to target schools, because schools, they're already doing it. You know, they're already there. You just need to strengthen. But we're talking about, uh, I think much have been talked about resilience, but I want to stray a little bit away because when you talk about resilience, there's only so much resilience you can give to a person. But if you don't actually tackle the social issues, you get to a school, uh, school students who are actually coming to school, you have given them all sorts of resilience. They are actually good when they are in school, they're okay. But when they go back, 
they face domestic violence, they face bullying among their peers, they also face, uh, for example, uh, probably a parent who's actually alcoholic. So that actually are the issues that we need to tackle and that is beyond school. So I think uh, when, uh, we, we have, of course, I agree there's so much work to do, but uh, maybe YB, uh, I would say that uh, I would actually hope that if you know all the parliamentary uh, members could actually look into their areas, you know, and, and actually uh, help to uh, address the mental health issues in your own uh, parliament seats. That would be so great. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anne. Uh, we're actually at 11.52. I'm going to ask everyone's uh, cooperation to extend this for another 15, 20 minutes. So it will end maybe about 12.15, 12 12.20. 12 um, and of course, uh, thank you so much for staying with us. Um, we're getting into a really interesting part of the conversation, which is that, which is what the paper actually also talks about, that this is a sort of intersection of poverty, um, unemployment, social economic status. You know, these are the, the issues and the conditions that exacerbate the problem. And I think what we're having now, and we have policymakers that recognize we have a health, a public health crisis, we have an economic crisis, but we also have therefore um, a mental health crisis, I suppose, in, in, in a way, because we know that poverty and unemployment definitely leads to these um, risk factors increasing. So I'm now going to ask a question from someone. Um, in your analysis, which group of economic categories, B20, M40, and B40, are vulnerable to suicidal attempts uh, or actually you know, death by suicide? And um, I want to ask a second question, which is not necessarily related, but this person is saying that I'm from a mental health NGO and I've noticed a worrying increase in mental health crisis, especially among Malay youths that is not recognized. It seems to be a lack of awareness, especially among Malay families regarding the importance of mental health, either outright denial of the existence of mental illness or blaming of the victims. There are many cases of unreported self-harm and suicide attempts that are shared with us. I feel that many of these cases are not reported, hence giving a sense of complacency that suicide or attempts among Malays are low. And this sort of like goes back to the statistics that the report um, showed, which is based on MOH uh, stats, that the suicide attempts, was it attempts or, or was it actually death by suicide uh, are highest among the Indian and then the Chinese and then the Malay communities. So this person is actually saying that, okay, it, it could be also about uh, the stigma and the, the unreporting trends. So um, this sort of poverty issue, and you can imagine, right? So Dr. Ang, you're saying that, yes, you give them the resilience, but when you go home, there's no job, there's no money, you know, there's no food on the table. Um, what, what is the point? I mean, that, that is essentially what you're saying it, it points towards. So maybe, um, I don't know, someone, maybe Vice Navi, because you were the one who talked about the statistics, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and also the, the B40, B20 aspects? Um, yeah, I think um, underlying issues of, of uh, like that, that Sukhang has mentioned, you know, emotion regulation and, and the, the awareness and understanding of mental health to begin with is definitely the foundation um, that is required. But uh, external social factors do have a stress as well. Um, I think I'm not entirely sure about the statistics on the different uh, income levels that affect uh, suicides, but uh, YB1 Chen actually um, made a paper in 2017 uh, where he looked at the interconnection between uh, mental health and poverty. Um, and basically the statistic that he reported is that prevalence of mental health problems among Malaysian, um, and he did this by monthly income, um, and it was highest at a 31.7% uh, for those who had a monthly income of 2,000 ringgit and below. So there, there seems to be this uh, correlation between uh, income levels and mental health issues. So again, stressing this not, does not necessarily tie into the suicide rate, but this is specifically on mental health issues. So we do see a trend on how poverty does affect mental health issues, but I think to understand the rate of suicides and uh, how that affects specific B40 group, M20, uh, M40 and T20 is something that requires a lot of 
deeper understanding and more research. Um, and that is crucial to understanding where to target interventions. And going back to that question on how a lot of young uh, Malay uh, kids are experiencing, um, you know, mental health issues or uh, suicidal ideation, um, I think there needs to be uh, a conversation regarding uh, the different religious narratives that come about when it comes to talking about suicide attempts. Um, and we do have this conversation a lot on this um, NGO level and the ideas and views on death uh, differ according to cultural and religious beliefs. And it's important to take those things into account when uh, targeting prevention strategies. Um, it is something that we need to understand the nuances of and be able to uh, approach according to the needs of a specific population. Okay, thank you so and much. I, sorry, Trisha, very short. I think it's, as we're kind of discussing this and it's, I'll highlight that it's really important maybe not to start viewing certain groups of people as you know problematic because it is quite easy to you know sort of change that narrative to be like you know this ethnic group has the problems and I think we actually need much much more research on what are the underlying factors that are putting certain groups uh, at risk you know the uh, vice Navi was talking about you know there's the religious narratives and we do know that religion is a protective factor for suicidality at the point of suicidality, honestly, anything that helps gives you a reason to live is good. And sometimes that's religion, sometimes that's the fear of going to hell. And sometimes, you know, the, at that point, I mean, it's not a great maybe reason for continuous living, but that's what you need at that at, at that moment. But we are talking about sy systemic, probably injustices and inequality, right? That some groups in our country don't have a lot of resources and, and some groups in our country are exposed to chronic social economic stresses, right? They're more likely to be abused. They're more likely to come across uh, substance abuse. They're more like physical abuse. Uh, they're more likely to live in poverty. And so those groups tend to be at higher risk, not just for suicide, but just ill health in general. You know, so it's good to look at the, the, the root factors rather than go, okay, this group, you know, the, the Malays or the Indians or the B40s, because really we, we want to recognize that anyone is vulnerable. If you were living in that situation, you would be vulnerable. Thank you so much, Dr. Shua. I think um, it's good that we bring it back uh, into not necessarily segmentizing or we tend to, you know, want to categorize people into boxes. Um, I want to move into uh, the question of so this is more about, again, I think probably Dr. Ang can come in here about the, the hospital system. So there's a question here about, um, I recently read an article that stated that the MOH has kept positions for clinical psychologists at 15, despite having 45 hospitals throughout the country offering psychiatric services. Um, if this is true, why is it so? So uh, maybe you can just go ahead and answer that one for now. Okay, thanks, Trisha. This is about perjawatan. I think for the past, I think, few years, we have been increasing our numbers of uh, clinical psychologists. We have at the, at present actually uh, 33 clinical psychologists, not 15 as what has been stated. So uh, we have 33 clinical psychologists, uh, but of course, uh, we know that uh, sometimes when we uh, when we actually advertise, the, the uptake is not as much. So what we have done, uh, we have actually uh, tried to strengthen our mental health system, uh, mental health care in terms of uh, 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 putting uh, 200. In fact, last year, while we were in the pandemic COVID, we managed to secure uh, 200 uh, positions of psychology counseling, counseling offices that is to be put at the ground. Uh, of course, uh, we also have counsellors at the hospital level. So if you're talking about clinical psychologists, of course, it's more appropriate to put it in the hospital. But at present, we have uh, 33 and we have uh, more to be filled. So you can apply through SPA, I think, uh, because that is uh, not within my sector. But uh, of course, we need more. Yes. But of course, as you know, uh, Dr. Chua, I think you're as a clinical psychologist yourself, the the perks outside is much more than Ministry of Health, of course. But uh, I mean, uh, if you still would, uh, we welcome uh, those people who love to work with Ministry of Health. But at the present, we have uh, the 200, we are increasing more because we think, I saw some, some questions that was written something about the importance of social worker. Is that correct? 
right. yeah, I think social worker is very, very important. And at present in Ministry of Health, we do have social worker, but of limited numbers. So uh, many, many more, I think, is uh, also uh, doing good jobs at uh, Menteri, Kementerian Wanita, that is Ministry of Women. And uh, I think we still have to work hand in hand because the needs for social worker, not just uh, when we're talking about, you know, from psychiatrists, count, uh, clinical psychologists, counsellors, and then social workers, and then we go down to the community leaders and things like that. We need to have that because, as I said, I think I would uh, repeatedly saying that uh, um, uh, something about, I just want to comment something about, they were saying about the uh, ethnic group you know, uh, highly vulnerable or more at risk, as I do agree that we shouldn't be paying attention, uh, not to say not to pay attention, but we have to address all ethnic group because as much as everyone is important and suicide is preventable. So I still uh, would like to, for example, like even in the Muslim society, for example, I think we would encourage that, uh, you know, community leaders and also the religious leaders, especially because uh, we know that uh, the youth, especially especially when they will only go to the people that they feel that they are in the safe zone. You know, for example, I have family members that comes to my children because they feel that, you know, you are in the safe zone. So as parents, what we can do, we educate our children. That is on my capacity. But, you know, uh, I feel that if we can ripple that, for example, if you're one person in the society and you have some mental health background and you know about suicide prevention, you can actually ripple the knowledge and you actually just take care of probably 20 families around you. I'm sure we have uh, may not be all, but uh, we can have that kind of family among us, you know, your your mother-in-law, father-in-law, etc., and things like that, you know. So I think if we can do that, uh, that would be actually good because, uh, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry for the thank long rattle. Um, I, I'm just going to address another two sets of questions and then after that, I'm going to uh, leave each of you to pro provide your closing remarks and reflections, but um, before that, this one, this first set of questions is about going back to the, de the decriminalization. So um, someone is saying if there's a targeted campaign, like what we're doing for COVID-19 vaccine for all MPs across the board so that there's political buy-in, uh, you know, wouldn't this be a good idea? And someone's actually asking, what is the status right now on the decriminalizing of suicide? So anyone who knows the status um, can respond here perhaps. Um, maybe Dr. Andrew, do you know? Okay, uh, maybe. I oh, okay, doesn't matter. Let Anne do it, Dr. Anne. Do you want to? <laughs> okay, um. uh, actually, uh, now the status because mm -hmm. we, we have brought the issues uh, uh, for quite some time with the attorney, uh, attorney general chamber, and I think um, now. Uh, uh, according to the feedback that they have given Ministry of Health that they are still doing a little bit more of a uh, kind of survey and research and uh, engaging with many parties, including uh, the firefighters, the PDRM, you know. And uh, so I find that uh, at the moment we are calling because we have our technical working group for suicide prevention and that also involves uh, the pihak berkepentingan, the stakeholders. So what we're going to do is that we're going to follow up. So at the moment, it's aligned with AG Chambers and uh, we are going through our penasihat undang-undang through that. So that is the safest. It's not that we are not looking into it, but I think because of the COVID pandemic, it's uh, sort of a little bit delayed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And maybe I can add something to it that as well. Now on, on behalf of MMHA, I can say that we have uh, reached out to every single parliamentarian. Unfortunately, uh, 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 YB, Michelle, and I must say that we left out the adults. So we will, we will uh, you know, uh, after this, perhaps I would ensure that every adun is reached out as well. So, um, and, and we are hoping to have a, a better response this time from parliamentarians. I must say the first round didn't quite get the response that I wanted, uh, at least in terms of our parliamentarians showing some interest in it. Uh, but hopefully now with uh, increased efforts, uh, we will get people from you know, both sides uh, of, of, of the new one to, to at least support the introduction of this debate uh, on decriminalization. And I had mentioned earlier, in what form or shape 
uh, finally materializes. Um, it's, it's not something for us to decide and hopefully greater wisdom among parliamentarians will, will, will decide on the outcome. But for us, I think the very fact that it's brought to parliament for discussion, whether or not it ends in a repeal of it or an amendment, um, we, 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 we will be quite uh, you know, happy that the debate actually took place and we await the results. Thank you so much, Jato. So the last set of questions is all about community efforts. Okay, so a lot of people are interested in, in community efforts. So um, there's a question here actually about um, how the collection of information for reporting on suicide rates uh, when it comes to suicide or mental health hotlines like the Befrienders, WHO, AWAM and so on, um, is it determined by the number of calls being made and what the reasons the calls were made for? Um, there's a question about this is just a, a question perception, so I, I don't, I'm not representing this uh, person's view, but this person's view is that Befrienders does not seem to have been very helpful um, in recent times, and why does it still remain the number one suicide hotline in media, despite its bad reviews in recent years? Um, and then there's a question about, um, for, so community efforts, uh, gatekeeper training, um, post-intervention support, I think somebody's also asking here about what happens after a suicide crisis, right? So suicide survival. I think this is post, um, yeah, the post event. Post event. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of questions, but I, I'm just going to read them out so that you can actually give me. You can choose to see how you want to respond. Um, do you believe that government should be forming their own agencies to provide a safe space for those with mental health issues, or is it more efficient for them to focus on empowering the existing civil society and NGOs? Um, and finally, what efforts are taken to educate and create awareness among parents when these youth go home to the parents? Uh, can schools gear towards inviting parents under PIBG for a start? This has to be done in a series and also a follow-up and teaching emotional regulations to parents are important. I think actually what I will do is, um, oh, and sorry, one more person is actually asking where can they channel inquiries to invite relevant authorities and organizations to, to voluntarily provide services or awareness programs. Um, I think these are all very good, you know, action oriented um, questions and comments. And I will actually invite each of you to provide your closing thoughts and hopefully you can incorporate some of the, the comments um, also to address the community oriented questions. So we will start from um, Dr. N. So we'll go in the order of the speakers and then I will end, I will let um, Vice Navi and then Dr. Chua give the, the very final words. So Dr. N, can you go and then I'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, I, I didn't, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Uh, I yeah. I think there was uh, so many questions. I didn't have the 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 time to actually write it down. But anyway, uh, okay. Uh, for certain things that uh, I think uh, one of the questions was about the gatekeeper training and postvention. We are also working. I think there are there are a few of our experts within the Ministry of Health and outside of the Ministry of Health is actually doing a very good job on this training. And uh, one of the things that uh, Ministry of Health, I think we have started uh, to work uh, is through our technical working group. So I think some of the viewers are also within our technical working group, actually, of the Ministry of Health. So uh, with that, I, we hope that we can move forward with uh, big agendas of uh, suicide prevention. Among them is the engagement with the media, uh, basically, to actually develop the suicide registry. So answering to that question on where do you get the data, uh, with the new suicide registry coming up, we have engaged with forensic because, as you know, whenever a person actually uh, is being uh, brought into the hospital uh, mortuary uh, because of suspected uh, suicide or uh, because the uh, upper, uh, of the diagnosis of sudden death, as we know, so they are brought in for post mortem. So basically, from then on. Uh, there is a probable whether uh, the result will be a probable case of suicide or highly suspected. And we have to work together with the PDRM because what PDRM will do is they will open a 
case investigation. That was the engagement that we, uh, when they open a case investigation, they will actually investigate, not just uh, how uh, the person is actually died and things like that. They will talk to the families and things like that. So what ministry is doing is actually getting our expert through this technical working group together with PDRM to ensure that we can come to that diagnosis. And uh, we will also uh, work with, our, with the forensics you know, uh, and, and actually to get the actual uh, suicide, the number of cases. So basically, we hope to get it done by this year. And uh, I think we are also relying on our National Strategic Action Plan. I think as a lot of people know that uh, we do have our National Strategic Action Plan is no more a draft, is going to be circulated soon. And one of the strategy among the eight strategies I would just share with you here is addressing suicide and suicidal behavior. So the big, big areas that we are working at the ministerial level is basically in increasing the competency also with the healthcare provider, not just at the hospital base, the primary care, and also the community and frontliners, uh, for example, like the firefighters and also the PDRM. So that's one. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, one of the things is uh, actually, I think we need to work into creating safer policies for safe public spaces. That is one of the activities that we, uh, we actually uh, are doing it. And uh, in terms of, um, I'm not so sure whether, I, I think, um, I have forgotten whether did I say actually we have actually uh, succeeded in banning uh, paraquat herbicides uh, on the 1st of January uh, 2020. Did I say that? No, so no. that is one of the one of the success that we have actually done. So uh, I feel that uh, answering to those question, um, as I said, I'm just going to wrap up the more important of uh, looking at the social issues that is causing mental health issues, depression and suicidal behavior, because once you will be able to detect a suicide behavior, so we, we hope that it wouldn't actually go to suicide. So answering the calls that, uh, that, that actually, uh, you know, when somebody was saying befriend us, I, I feel that um, uh, we are not in the capacity to answer for, for Befrienders. Justin is not here, but I know that Befrienders are so overwhelmed. So Ministry okay. of Health has also created a helpline during COVID, uh, Talian Psychosocial. And just to share, uh, last year, we, we have about, uh, from the calls, from a total of 43,078 call, calls last year that was highlighted in the news, we had about, uh, I think, 34 that was directly related to suicide attempt, yeah, and, and suicide attempt and suicidal behavior that we managed to link to the hospitals. So I think uh, that's about it. Lah. So, uh, okay, I'll wrap it there. Thank you. I mean, with someone like you um, helming the, the MOH uh, division of mental health, I think it's, it's really good to have, to have someone like you there. Uh, Trisha, I, I'm going to acknowledge my, my uh, huge officers here, Dr. Noli, Dr. Raihan, uh, who are there doing a lot of work, you know, in a very short uh, term of period engaging of uh, mental health, you know, so I think I think uh, I owe that to them also. Thank you. Yes, yes, uh, it's always good. To, I mean, our teams always are stand behind, standing behind us, right? So uh, thank you. Uh, Tengku Iman, can you now provide your responses and also some well, uh, closing reflections? Uh, yeah, I would just like to Again, thank you all for having me. And uh, yeah, so as you can all probably see, and to all those who have tuned in, it's not like MOH is not doing anything. Of course, they are. They have been doing things for years. It's just that we need to really open our eyes and see that the effort is there, but it also needs to be collective. I feel like it cannot just come from MOH. It has to come from everyone. I think when you know, it's not just the advocates who have to do the work. Everyone plays a role in this. It's a, it should be a societal approach. It should come, it should start at home from the parents to the kids, to the sisters, to the brothers. It can't just be the, the, the policies and the governments who, 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 who push this agenda forward. It should come from everyone. So I just kind of want to see more of a collective effort rather than, oh, what's MOH doing about it? Or what's uh, the advocates or the NGOs doing about it? It's about what are we doing about it as a society? And for, yeah, for everyone to sort of just be kinder to one another and show more compassion. So yeah, that's all uh, I would like to say, just to emphasize that this, this agenda can only be pushed forward if we push it forward together. That's Thank you all. so much, Thank you. Iman. I mean, it really does involve a cultural shift, I think. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah. In Thank society. Thank you, Thank you Iman. Um, Dr. Dr. Andrew, please. Uh, okay, I just need to echo what Dr. Anne and Thank you, Iman have said just now. 
Uh, this is a collective effort. But I want to emphasize here that while we focus on advocacy or scaling up of services and hoping for policy changes, uh, what would eventually drive this is also research. And therefore, I think we need to use this opportunity to congratulate both ideas and uh, relate to have taken some uh, you know, efforts in, in, in introducing numbers, so to speak, because numbers really speak uh, volumes and uh, it will be statistics and research that will eventually help shape policies. Um, another thing that I wanted to add on here in closing is the fact that we do have a mental health and well-being coalition now and an initiative that was started by the Rotary Club of Malaysia and along with many... We're losing you a little bit, Andrew. Yeah. Wi-Fi can get a bit. That's right. Okay. Sorry, Andrew. And interestingly, there's 30 odd uh, stakeholders here are not traditionally. Hello? Hello? The internet's okay. a little bit Bye. problematic. Um, carry on. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that this coalition. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so this mental health coalition is something new that Tanku Putri is the royal patron of this coalition. But interestingly, the, the significant number of stakeholders in this coalition are not traditionally mental health uh, organizations or NGOs. A lot of other like-minded people have come into this. And it was an initiative that was started by Dato Bindi and Dr. Siti of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Rotary Club of Malaysia. And this is now slowly evolving into a big movement, really. Uh, and one of the main things, the agenda here is the decriminalization of suicide. So hopefully we will see some things happening in this area soon. But ultimately, I think I want to underscore the, the importance of collaboration. And this has been a theme by all the other speakers as well. So, you know, if we, if we, if we get together and burganding uh, bahu, we'll be able to, to, to do things more efficiently and faster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Andrew, and uh, all the best also to MMHA. Uh, YB Michelle, please. Yeah, um, I, I won't touch on what has already been mentioned. Um, one thing that I, from, from engaging with civil servants on the ground, I, I do sense that capacity is something that uh, we really need to consider. Um, in government. Um, I'm talking about even JKM officers as well who uh, have personally expressed to me that they are overwhelmed. So what, what is uh, perhaps something that we can consider, and this is also again a suggestion from the agency, is actually posed in one of the questions to us of whether we should consider decentralization um, of resources um, and empowering, uh, and empowering organizations that are already doing the work since what they are lacking perhaps is funding and support, which government would have, but what they have that we don't have is, is human resource and, 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 and professional resource as well. Um, so I think this is something that we need to seriously consider in order to, to achieve the holistic approach that we keep talking about. Um, perhaps instead of shouldering so much responsibility, government shouldering so much responsibility, perhaps we need to share responsibility as, as well through decentralization. Um, I, I think that all the work that everyone is doing is, is really good. I think everyone is of the same mind. I, I hope that we can continue in this line uh, to, to collaborate with one another um, to ensure that we don't overlap with each other's uh, work so that we all can be efficient. Um, and that is also the aim of what we want to do, what I want to do as well. Um, in so far as uh, the, the decriminalization of uh, suicide is concerned, um, I, I just want to state here my utmost support uh, to the effort. Uh, having seen and dealt with cases personally myself, I do see how far along that would go um, in changing the system, but more importantly, the narrative um, of, of government to its people of how they uh, would like to treat people who are facing such difficulties that we don't want them punished um, instead, what we think is best is to help them instead. 
Um, I hope that we are collective in that. I hope my colleagues are collective in that as well. Um, and that I, I, I certainly do hope that we'll be able to achieve the outcome of decriminalizing section 309 of, you know, for, yeah. So that's all from me, thanks. Thank you so much, Ravi Michelle. So after this webinar, I hope like you now start this coalition building effort, right? From within the party now. Uh, I'm only half kidding. I, I do hope to see uh, perhaps some movement in that front. Uh, I would now like to pass the time to Vice Navi and Dr. Chua uh, to provide their kind of closing thoughts. Uh, if you want to draw back to the paper, you can. If not, just respond to um, some of the many points that have come up here. So maybe, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Vice Navi first? Vice Navi can go first, yeah. Okay. Vice Navi. Hi, yeah, um, I'll just keep it very short. Um, I think I just want to draw on some observation that we've had based on the discussion today. Um, and based on the questions that have been posed, I think it's quite clear that there is a lot of responses and there's also a lot of uncertainties within people um, who are asking questions as to where to get resources, what is the community engagement, what is available out there. And I think uh, we very much recognize the efforts of Ministry of Health. Um, and I think we acknowledge the work that is being done for years now, but uh, there are a lot of gaps that we do need to work together to improve moving forward um, and dissemination of existing resources needs to be a little more effective. Um, I think beyond that, I think uh, we also have talked a lot about the lack of understanding on the socioeconomic effects that create larger vulnerabilities in specific groups. Um, and I think these observations uh, require in-depth research for us to really understand what uh, the vulnerabilities are. Um, so that we can start targeting um, interventions more effectively. Um, and lastly, I think uh, a lot of in, a lot of programs have been introduced in in the last ten years or so, um, counseling in school systems, etc. But what we really need is uh, evaluation and research to understand is the existing programs effective? How can we improve it? And uh, what can we do better moving forward? Um, so yeah, I think I'll just end there and uh, pass it on to Dr. Chua for um, closing remarks. Thank you, Vice Navi, Dr. Chua. Thanks. Uh, unlike Vice Navi, I might keep it long, <laughs> a little longer. Uh, I, I think I think I'm in a little bit of a unique position because I'm involved in all aspects of Relate, which is I trained our therapists every week. I go for my own training. I see clients and then I do the research. And so to the comments that, you know, why are the services not effective there? And, and I, I think what Dr. Ann said is correct. Um, and probably Andrew uh, also has that similar experience. All our services are overwhelmed. And the, the larger the demand and, you know, the, 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 the struggling and, and, and balancing between we need as much people to man the lines, to be therapists, to be counselors. And then, but we also need them to be really effective. Now, training takes time, you know. And so our team is small because I, I want good training and our recovery rate is actually really good. It's comparable. Um, it's above the average community health uh, recovery rates as put as published, but that, that, that takes so much quality control that a national hotline actually simply does not, may, may not have the resources for, you know? So in, instead, I think, I think everyone going, may calling befrienders, people would have different experiences. People seeing me as a psychologist will also have a different experience. I am not everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone who sees me will get better, but that doesn't mean it's not effective at all. So instead I'll argue that actually more money and more resources need to be put in to those, to those hotlines, like befrienders needs funding. MMHA needs funding. I'll say Relate also needs funding. You know, YB Michelle's community program needs funding. So in order for us, since it's not just about programs and more and more programs, it's about can these program, are these programs well-funded to provide effective services that can actually meet the needs of the community? So the more we want to put everyone out there, it's just going to take time. And I know there's this, we're in the in-between period where people are saying, hey, we really need a lot of help. But, you know, uh, clinical psych is still a relatively young field in Malaysia. Even psychiatry actually is a relatively young field in Malaysia compared to other countries. And so it's just going to take time for us to get the numbers up. I'm glad there's like, and the collective demand by society is what's needed, you know. So the more you guys push for it, the more we see there's importance for that. And the more resources, hopefully, effective resources we can put out. But... 
I really um, learned a lot for today's discussion. I am actually glad to see there's so much on, on the ground. And I think what it, it taught me was that so much more work, you know, of, of every what everyone is doing needs to be publicized. Because, you know, Vice Novi and I, obviously, we scoured the internet, <laughs> Google search, thank you, you know, to find out all this information. But it, it was it was tough. You know, so I think really, I hope media watching, you know, publicize the good work that everyone here is doing. And then so that would encourage more funding to these very, very good programs. Um, yeah, and let's all work together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tra. And once again, uh, on behalf of Ideas, I think I just want to thank again this collaboration between our two organizations. Uh, thank you also, Andrew, for highlighting the importance of research. So this is where we come in as a public policy think tank. Um, you know, we don't have the experience nor the expertise of being doctors, we're not clinical psychologists, nor psychiatrists, nor have experience and breadth of community efforts the way that many of you do. But we do have strength in research. And I think the more research there is on these subjects, the more light can be shed, the more advocacy can be done, and we can make decisions based on evidence, data-driven um, data-driven policy making is what this country really needs, not just on mental health, by the way, on everything else as well. And that's where uh, we hope to make a difference. And I really like that um, we're ending on this note on, on funding and resources, because at the end of the day, um, yes, we can talk about compassion and, and empathy and doing our collective bit, but we all know from organizations like ours, we can only survive based on the resources. So we're only as good as how institutionalized we can, we can get. And I do hope that anyone from the private sector who's here will also consider yourself part of the community. So private sector, um, do consider how you can contribute to not just the research, but advocacy and all the community efforts that are going on here. Um, as you hear, all of the systems are overwhelmed right now. And we know that this is going to be a prolonged uh, condition pandemic, despite the vaccines coming here, uh, and is not going to end anytime soon. So we're going to see a long-term ramifications and effects of what has happened in the last 12 months going forward. So with that, um, thank you so much. Please continue to follow our work. Uh, go to our Ideas website and Relate Malaysia website and see where you can contribute. Um, I look forward to seeing where we can take all of these efforts. Like I said, it's the first time that Ideas is doing anything related to mental health, but um, certainly hope that it's not the last. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. We've gone way be beyond time. Uh, but I'd like to pass the time now back to Sarah Zihan. So Zihan, over to you. Thank you, Trisha. And thank you, panelists and audience members for that wonderful and interactive session. It's reassuring to know that the current efforts from various organizations out there has done so much to create awareness among you and their families. And more can be done by bringing all of these organizations together to fill up the gap and really work towards prevention. And this includes boosting mental health literacy, not just in households, but among community leaders, educators, and even in law enforcement. I look forward to seeing what all of us can do together and I hope that the audience feels moved today to take action with us. So that ends our event for today. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and just a reminder to the speakers to stay on for a quick debrief. Thank you everyone. Good afternoon. Take care and stay safe.